I'll introduce myself. My name's Andrea Merriam with the PMD Alliance. Um, today you're joining Navigating Hospitalizations with Parkinson's. Excited to introduce you to our esteemed guest. I'll start by going over some housekeeping items though, so we're all settled. Um, so this program is being recorded, so you'll be able to access it later, um, share with friends and family if necessary. Um, we've also enabled the subtitles, so you can toggle that on, you can toggle that off. Um, the way to control that is the more button, the three dot ellipsis at the bottom. Click on that, turn on the subtitles, turn them off, turn on the transcript. However you want to experience today's program is up to you. Um, while you're in that menu bar, I'll point out the chat button right smack dab in the middle with the little speech bubble icon. Um, that is going to be a great place to send in questions and like Gilbert from South Florida chimed in with. Um, yes, I invite everyone to, to just give that a practice go round and put in the chat where you are joining from. Um, I am in Arizona and my teammate Kelly here is in Nashville, Tennessee. If anyone has any technical problems, they can't hear, uh, they have questions about Zoom, Kelly is our IT tech genius. So put your questions in the chat and she'll send you a private message walking you through all of that. And in addition, um, to Kelly, joining us from Gainesville, Florida, is Dr. Michael Oaken. So I, I'm sure, does everyone know who Dr. Oaken is, right? Wave, uh, wave hands. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So you go without introduction, but just in case, I will go ahead and, uh, and tell you all a little bit about Dr. Oaken. So he's currently the Chair of Neurology, Professor and Executive Director of the Norman Fixel Institute for Neurological Diseases at the University of Florida Health College of Medicine. He was instrumental in the construction of a one-stop patient-centered clinical research experience, I love that, experience, uh, for national and international patients seeking uh, care at the University of Florida. And this change in care and research delivery has since been named the Service and Science Hub Model of Care. Uh, the UF Center draws visitors from all over the world inter interested in deploying this innovative model. And in addition, Dr. Oaken's also published over 400 peer-reviewed articles, though that number probably has uh, climbed higher since this was written. He's authored multiple books, including um, Parkinson's Treatment, 10 Secrets to a Happier Life, 10 Breakthrough Therapies for Parkinson's Disease, and one of my personal favorites, um, Ending Parkinson's Disease. Have you all read that? That is a powerful one. I recommend everyone uh, um, check that out. And Dr. Oaken is also the National Medical Director of the Parkinson Foundation. So. Welcome, Dr. Oaken. Did I did I get all of your uh, all of your listen, uh, in there? Listen, I'm just happy to talk to everybody in a house with uh, a couple of teenagers. If anybody wants to listen to anything I have to say, it's a great day. So thank you for having me. Yes, welcome, welcome. And it's wonderful to see everyone in uh, chiming in where you are in the world in the chat. So glad that you're here and. We're, so today we're going to be talking about hospitalizations. So Dr. Oaken, why are you passionate about this? Why is this a crucial topic for people with Parkinson's? Yeah, so um, so first welcome everyone. I know that you know it's it's stressed on everyone with COVID-19 and up and down and on the pandemic and and all of these things. And so it, it's great to be together and I'm glad that we can do this through through Zoom. Uh, Parkinson and hospitalization has been a passion of mine for many years, for over a decade, and it's kind of an interesting story as to why that is. And it is because um, many of you may have remembered there was something on your computers that used to be called MS-DOS. Remember those DOS things and you could program in basic and everything? Well, we used to have this kind of DOS-based old-fashioned system at Parkinson Foundation where we would answer questions for people online. And some of you may have written in and gotten a question answered on Ask the Doctor. 
And um, there's a fair chance I answered that question because we answered tens of thousands of these questions in three different systems until we finally retired it and, and entered the modern age and then and started a 1-800 helpline for folks. But what I learned from people, from you, from families is the devastating impact of hospitalizations in Parkinson. And so we began to hear this over and over on Ask the Doctor. We took it to our national leadership conference that we have every year for all the centers of excellence, at centers of excellence I or whatever you call it, the plural of that, you know, from around the world get together and they're supposed to talk and, you know, check their egos at the door and talk about what the important issues are. And one of the really important issues was we felt like people going in the hospital for whatever reason were coming out worse off than they went in. And some people weren't coming out with Parkinson. So we got very concerned. And because of that, we began to get together, review what was known about it, start to run some studies, you know, fast forward now several years down the road, try to create some strategies, kits, other things to help folks. Now, it is really important to know that, you know, so, so some of you may be outside of the United States. In the United States, there's about a, a million plus people with Parkinson, probably more than a million, depends on, again, how you count the numbers. And about 300,000 of you are going to receive some sort of hospital care during the year, okay? 300,000 of you. And so those numbers are really high. And so that means that year after year, you're going to end up going to the hospital. We need to, to develop systems to help to keep you safe and help to improve hospitalization for you. So it's a reality and it's, it's one that we need to do a better job with. So that's kind of how I got into it, Andrea. Very good. Well, um, appreciate that uh, listening to what people are asking for and putting together those resources. Um, and you mentioned the 300,000. So is that uh, for age matched non PD peers? So are people with Parkinson's more likely to be hospitalized than their peers? Yeah, so we've actually looked at this problem a, a number of different ways. And if you look at the data, you know, from a number of different studies, the answer is yes, you are more likely to be hospitalized with Parkinson than without. And it's probably in the neighborhood of 1.5 or so risk. So it's a higher risk than, than normal, than just from, from, we don't say getting older, Andrea, we say getting more seasoned. So as you get more seasoned. I like that. Um, and um, so it can be non-planned or like Ken put in the chat, it can be a planned surgery um, when it comes to how to, if it is, you know, something that you can prepare for, let's start there. If you know that you have a surgery or something, what advice would you give, um, to people like our friend Ken in Oregon? Yeah. So, um, Ken, thank you for the question. Um, Oregon, great state of Oregon admitted because of James Polk, who was the American president decided it was time to bring the Oregon territory into the U S so. It's good to have your question. And we wanted to, to, um, to begin to understand this, not just from unplanned hospitalizations and emergency room visits, Ken. We wanted to dig into this and start to understand it because a lot of you need to go to the hospital for various things. You might need a colonoscopy. You might have a broken bone, you know, a minor broken bone, or you might have a major broken bone, like a hip or, or something like that. Or you may just need to go in to have your tonsils out or, or something like that. And so a lot of times you'll be going in for elective surgeries. And as you become more seasoned, remember, we don't say old, we say seasoned. As you become more seasoned, Ken, you're going to have more of these things that, that are going to happen. Just, just, you know, we just have to accept it. Okay. The, the odds and the chances are more with out Parkinson more with Parkinson even more than than without. Okay, so so you, so you're gonna have this. And so when we have folks that we know, it's like having intelligence information. If you were a CIA agent and you say, okay, I know what's gonna happen here. Okay, I'm predicting and I know you know how things are gonna go. Okay, that I'm gonna go in. We need to have you be ready to go in. And so a couple of things that we tell people for elective surgeries, which it was, it was the basis of your question. We could talk about other stuff too throughout this hour, 
But a couple of things that we talk about is one, always great if your neurologist can speak with your anesthesiologist or your surgical team, if there's gonna be anesthesia for it, if it's more than a minor procedure. That actually is not a small thing. It's a lot to ask. And a lot of times you can't pull it off. Okay, so I, I'm not gonna sit here and tell you something that's impossible, okay? But if it's possible for you to grease the wheel and have them talk, great, okay? Second thing, review your medications and be your own advocate and don't assume that they know more than you. You may actually know more than the people taking care of you about Parkinson when it comes to surgery. And so if you're on drugs like MAOB inhibitors, these are things like selegiline or risagiline or one of those drugs, even though it's, it only has an interaction with some of the anesthetics, you know, if you stop it a week or two before, it could be safer if somebody doesn't know and they give you something like a halothane based anesthetic. And so it's pretty safe. They're very mild in terms of their symptomatic improvement. So pretty safe to stop them abruptly and restart unless it's the only medication that you're on. And obviously you wanna do this with your doc, okay? If you're on pain medications, okay, any sort of pain medications, then knowing about that going in is important because some of the anesthetics could have side effects with pain medications. And if you're, again, if you're on an MAOB inhibitor, if they give you pain medications, there could be a bad reaction between those things. And so knowing about that is important. If you um, are somebody that really needs to have your dopamine pill, which pretty much defines the majority, if not almost everyone who has Parkinson who's here, if you need your pills and you have offs and severe offs, then coming off your meds for long periods of time is not a good solution. And so, so actually bringing some meds with you, um, um, telling your surgeon or informing them that you'd like to take some at least a few hours before, they're worried you're gonna vomit and it's gonna go down the wrong tube. But if you don't get the meds and you don't get them absorbed into your system, you're gonna be potentially worse off and stiff and rigid. And so seeing if you can negotiate to get you know, some meds in you, even a few hours before the procedure, you know, to get some meds in you so that when you wake up, you're ready. And then when you're ready, when you wake up, if you can take your own meds or they're ready to dose you with a dose of your meds, that would be great. If you have a stimulator in place, you, know, you, you need to talk with the, whichever manufacturer to make sure you know what to do in terms of turning on or off the stimulator. There are helplines for each of the, the different types of stimulators. If you have a deep brain stimulator, that's something that has to be dealt with. And sometimes just, you know, there are settings that you can flip those things to so they don't get in, in, uh, in the way of monitoring like EKGs and, and things like that. And then finally, we think of but light, you know, anesthesia is light, okay? And, uh, and you want lighter is better. If they can keep you awake, you know, better, okay? If they can keep you as light as possible, better. You know, if they can get things out of your system, in and out of your system with anesthetic agents, better. So, so, so less is more. There's an old fashioned, you know, um, saying less is more. When it comes to anesthesia, less is more. And then getting up and moving and making sure there's somebody there with you to, so that when you're off balance or you're off a little bit after you have an elective surgery, that you don't fall. And, um, and so those are the general things that we worry about. If you go in, you know, if you get admitted to the hospital for something, then it's a totally different ball game. Then we start to add more things. But those are the general things. This would be like if you were sitting in clinic and I was your cabinet advisor and I was giving you advice, these would be the kinds of things, Ken, that I would advise you on, whether you live in Oregon or in Florida. Okay. Very good. And you, um, let's talk about having someone with you. So I see a few, uh, uh, couples out there. I see Mr. and Mrs. Woods are there. Um, I see, uh, let's see, uh, Bob and Linda. So um, can you talk now to maybe the folks who are care partners um, in the audience, if it is a, if it is their loved one who is um, about to uh, go for a procedure, all of the same advice, or since they will actually be awake, would, would there be any different advice for them? Yeah. So, um, so you know, I, I think that, um, that it's a good question, but first I want to just respond to, to Sheila and Tucson, and you make a great point about preferring the term older than the euphemistic seasoned and factually descriptive word that may be the opposite of a 
uh, user's intent and may may attach a, a negative stigma. So I'll definitely think about uh, about that one. I, you know, I, I'm I'm trying to figure out what it, what is a word that's that's better. You know, like that that would that doesn't shut down discussions when I'm sitting with family members. Um, so leading now into that to the to the discussion with the family member and the care partner. Okay. It's really important that you don't go to the hospital alone if you can help it, okay? You need an advocate. Probably one of the most important things that you can have with you, one of the most important weapons that you can have is not a medicine, it's not a, the surgery itself, it's the person, it's the care partner that's with you. Whether you're going to the, um, the, the emergency room or you're going to the hospital for surgery planned or unplanned or in an ambulance, having somebody there that can interpret for you that has the meds, okay, there. And then you wanna lobby, if they can be with you at all times, getting your meds on time every time, we know it, our studies have shown us three out of every four people don't get them on time every time. So having a care partner that, that has the actual med bottles from the pharmacy, you can turn those in in most hospitals, they'll take them to the pharmacy, They'll log them in, they'll give them back to you, and they'll allow you to administer the dopamine medication to make sure the person's getting it on time every time. And so that can be another way to, um, to, to ensure that you have the best possible outcomes. The, the care partner, the caregiver or care partner also should seek out to either have an aware and care kit from the Parkinson's Foundation, their free kits. We've given over 100,000 of them. This was after you publish a few dozen of these papers on hospitalization, you say, who the heck reads the paper? Let's have something that's practical. We are not able to teach everybody in the world how to do this. And so the best that we've been able to come up with right now, I'm not saying this is the best solution, but the patch solution that we have right now is to teach the caregivers, care partners, and people with Parkinson's themselves, the, the, the persons themselves, how to be great advocates. And so we can put a kit in their hands that has all the things you need and it has information you can rip off and give to the practitioners about things they should and shouldn't do. But also, it, you know, what it does is it empowers you, okay? And it says, hey, here's, here's national organization, here's the data, here's the thing. And people will get, you'll get the attention of the staff, you'll get the attention of the, the charge nurses who are in charge. You know, you don't have to do it in a mean or upsetting way or anything. And, and to make sure, you know, as you change shifts, don't assume that people really know kind of what's, what's going on. So, so your, your biggest weapon is actually having a great either caregiver, care partner, friend, or someone there that can help you to, to navigate through from beginning to end of the process. Andrew, does that answer your question or was there an aspect of that question I didn't address? It does. I think... Um... Uh, and the aware and care kit, Kelly put the, the link in the chat. So have a person with you and have both of you armed with that aware and care kit that has the data that has the information for the healthcare providers, uh, in the hospital setting to review. Um, that does answer my question. And if any care partners out there have follow-ups again, please send them in, um, in the chat, we want to make this interactive. We don't want it to be, you know, information without application is just trivia. So we don't want this just to be trivia. We want this to be relevant to your concerns, your life. So please uh, send in your questions. Um, and let's see. So there's a lot of different directions we can go. Um, I do, okay, I, I do, let's respond to some of the things in the chat. Karen has a good question. So yes, theoretically, it's being fierce, being an advocate. I need my meds on time. My loved one needs their meds on time. But Karen's saying, it's still always a fight. Are there any tips? Yeah, so, um, so, so Karen, this is absolutely, I mean, I don't wanna be, you know, super Pollyanna on this. This is the patch, this is the best solution that we've come up with, which is try to empower you with information and then use that information to empower the, the staff and the people in the hospital so that they can get the best outcome and, the, and have the, the, the shortest length of stay, okay? There are a couple of things that, that are kind of like 
vocabulary. Like we all have like little vocabulary. Like, so if you play a different sport or if you're in chess or, or you're in, everybody speaks a little different language and they understand each other more if you speak their language. Okay. So I'm going to teach you three words that, that is a language that every one of your nurses and every one of your hospital administrators understand. And that's called length of stay. Okay. Length of stay, you know, will, will, impact how whether somebody else can use that bed it'll impact the economics of the hospitalization it'll impact how much you know the 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 hospital makes how much extra unnecessary um uh um a money goes to medicare or to expenses unnecessary expenses and so there's a big driver and, and i'm not saying that this is right or wrong i'm making no judgment on this what i'm teaching you is the language with which an administrator in the hospital speaks and administrators and social workers and everybody in the hospital, they speak length of stay language, okay? So if you say to them, here's this kit from Parkinson Foundation, here's some information on here, this can decrease my length of stay here and you can get me out of here quickly. And that's that's what I want. That becomes a common outcome. Like, like that's what you want is to get out as soon as you can because you know that's your, your best chance for uh, for, for recovery and the longer you stay in, the more issues you could encounter and the more medication errors and other things. So you wanna go in and go out and have it be as smooth as possible. And you wanna say to them, look, here's some information. It's from the Parkinson's Foundation. It's from dozens of different studies and study groups. These are the world's experts. We know that you don't know a lot about Parkinson's disease and we wanna like try to help you and, and not be annoying, okay? That's two. Number three is, telling, um, not telling, not talking at your nursing staff. You wanna talk with them, okay? Family members, and, and I'm just gonna throw this out blanketly, I'm making an observation, you know, like the Dalai Lama says, observe, but don't judge, right? Making an observation here. Family members and care partners get so, like they're so, um, you know, they're such advocates, they're, they're so involved in every aspect and they just don't wanna see anything go on. They tend to talk at the hospital staff, okay? Talk at the hospital staff. And if you talk at the hospital staff, Karen, you will get less done talk with the hospital staff, okay? And as much as you wanna just be like, oh, I'm gonna tell you, like, I got you, like you're doing it wrong, you know, like you have to talk with them. You have to listen to them, even if they're doing it wrong and, and, and be patient in that conversation. You're going to be there for hours and hours anyway. Be patient in that conversation. Let them get it out and then bring your information forward and, and make it a, a dialogue, okay? A win-win dialogue. The win-win is they all want short lengths of stay, okay? They all want, you know, they don't want to be called every two or three hours, okay? So if, if you can bring the actual pills and the bottle and say, hey, can you take these to your pharmacist and register them and I'll do all the Parkinson meds. And, and then you don't have to do this every two hours or whatever. They're gonna love you, you know, like, you know, like you've just made a friend. And so thinking through it in that way. And then when they approach you and you're like, this is wrong, you know, this is wrong, okay? Don't have that response. It's kind of like your kids, you know, it's wrong. You see them doing it, you know, it's wrong but you have to talk with them. If you talk at them, it's only going to make the situation worse. So you have to remember, you're going to be there for hours, maybe for days. You have to play the long game. You're going to come prepared with all this information and all this advocacy, and you've got to spend time investing in their relationship. Your outcome in the hospital will travel at the speed of the relationships you make with the nurses and with the staff and with the doctors, even if you don't like them and they don't like you. Your outcomes will travel at the speed of that those relationships. And so you have to step back and become, you know, Sigmund Freud and do a little psychoanalysis and get in their heads and listen to them a lot. And, um, and they always say, you wanna be successful in the hospital, make friends with the nurses, the doctors, the PTs, the OTs, the staff. Even if they're, even if they're patently wrong, have be patient like you would with your kids and trying to to show them like that they're wrong but but you don't don't have to tell them they're wrong so it's a it's a it, it's really 
it's it's tricky. It's terrible. It shouldn't be like this. It shouldn't be that we have to be the advocates like this. But but that's kind of where we are. And these are tips and pearls. Listen, I'm just your cabinet advisor. You don't have to listen to anything that I say. But but um, but these are just some tips and pearls. If you put them in your pocket, you you might be more successful with your hospitalization. Love it. Now we're getting to the good stuff. If we set aside should, we put it on a shelf. Let's talk pragmatic. What can we do? I love that. Speak their language. What are they motivated by? That length of stay, that is such a good pearl of wisdom. Um, if that's what's driving them and their you know, staff meetings and their metrics, let's speak their language. Um, talk about what's mutually beneficial for both parties. And I love the not talk at them. I mean, we're in the middle of a, a healthcare worker burnout. Uh, I don't know if you all saw the Surgeon General called it out that, you know, healthcare workers are, yeah, they're burning out. This is year 57, it feels like, of the pandemic. And, you know, they've been at the front lines. They are stressed. So they're human beings too. Uh, so I know that's hard and it, it sh yet I agree, it should not be that way. You should get the optimum, you know, uh, care. It's not too much to ask that people understand about a disease when you're in a hospital, but hey, let's set should aside and, you know, what, uh, what can we do um, to be pragmatic? So thank you, Dr. Oaken. That was, that was helpful. I hope everyone was taking notes or you can rewatch the recording for that. And some questions have come up. Um, so we started with, you know, planned surgeries, um, you know, colonoscopy, things planned in advance. So there's been some questions in the chat about the ER and unplanned visits. Let's uh, transition to that, if, uh, if that sounds good. So Ray Grasso did say that being in the ER is a whole different matter. Unfortunately, he's been in three different ERs and staff has no time for special attention to people with Parkinson's. So what would you say to Ray and, you know, what, how is the ER um, different than what we've been talking about so far? Yeah, so Ray, first of all, you're, you're absolutely right. You don't need me to tell you that you're right, but I'm going to tell you that you're right. The, the emergency room is like a different planet, right? So there's like planet Earth that we all inhabit. There's shopping malls, there's clinics. And then there's this place that, you know, like you go to where things just aren't right, you know, and, you know, and it's unpredictable. It's, you know, it, it, it's a very difficult terrain you never know what the topography is going to be, and it can change in a second, both for you or for other folks that are there. Okay, so the first piece of advice I give people going to the emergency room is <clears throat> be proactive and try not to go to the emergency room. Okay, so now don't get me wrong. I, I, I have said this before and it, it can lead to disaster, okay? So if you have something really bad, your eyeballs popping out or something, no, please go to the emergency room, okay? If you have chest pain, go to the emergency room, right? But um, if you feel like something is starting to go wrong with Parkinson disease, okay? Like you're starting to get a little bit confused, something ain't right, get into your doctor right away. Okay, right, like, like, early. There's one word I could give you. It would be early. Get in there early and have them check a urinary, you know, a, even if you're a man, okay, have them check, you know, for a urinary tract infection, make sure you're not dehydrated, make sure it's not a medication effect, you know, get some blood work, get in there early, okay, and see if you can solve this before, like, if it's an infection or something that can, is going to turn into a pneumonia or it's going to get worse, they can treat you, like, right away. Now with COVID-19, okay, it's really important for you to get that diagnosis early of COVID-19. So get your free kits from the U.S. Postal Service for, for COVID testing and, and make sure that if you, if you turn up positive, that you get on the, the, the medications. One of the medicines like Paxlovid is one of the medications. There's a great website 
from the University of Liverpool in London that you can look at what side effects things might have on your individual medications that you're on. And you always want to talk to your doc about that because there are certain meds for your heart and things like that that you want to be super careful of. But if you can stave off that, you know, emergency room visit, you know, by being proactive and getting to the clinic, okay, good move. Okay, so that, that's my first, you know, like the, the first thing that I would say. Second thing is, is again, when you're on this planet, okay, and nobody speaks your language anymore, nobody in the emergency room has time to speak Parkinson. You speak a language called Parkinson. They don't speak a language called Parkinson. They speak a language called stabilize and make sure people don't die, okay? They have two directions. You go up to it or you go home. You know, you either you either stay or you go. It's a binary system in the emergency room, right? That system can tie you up for days sometimes, you know, down there. You know, hopefully not, but it certainly can as it gets busy. Okay. So they're trying to make a decision on you. You know, can they stabilize and send you back out for follow-up? Or are they going to admit you to the hospital? Okay. We know that you'll do far better in general if we can avoid the hospital admission and we can take care of it as an outpatient, okay? If we can't, then getting in the hospital is a good idea. Then you need to right away, if they're writing the orders in the emergency room, you need to right away, make sure that your med orders are written, you know, for your dopamine pills with specific times, not doctors have old fashioned language. And remember now, now we speak a different language than you speak, okay? And the language we speak is, in Latin and we say, give it three times a day in Latin or four times a day or whatever, it doesn't work, okay? It needs to be given at specific times, 8 p.m., 9.30, half a pill. They don't know about this half pill business either, okay? None of the people in the ER or in the hospital, they half pills, quarter pills, what the hell are you talking about? I mean, so again, they're speaking a different language. So you've got to, you've got to start to get down and speak their language, bring the medication bottles, see if they'll allow you to be there and administer medications. That's obviously the best answer, okay, if, if possible. But if you have something super serious, like wrong with you and you need to come in the hospital, no doubt come in the hospital. Maybe you're, there's a hole in your colon and you need to have a surgery or something like that. So that gets back to several of the other things that we talk about, core principles here. Watch out for monoamine oxidase inhibitors because sometimes they can get, they can have side effects with pain medications and they can have side effects with, um, with, uh, with certain anesthetics, right? So if, if there's something safe to come off of that could decrease the amount of, of, of harm that could come to you, that would be the easy one to peel off. Particularly if you're on uh, other Parkinson medications, you're not gonna feel that one as much. Watch for urinary tract infections and for hydration status and pneumonias and things like that. Very common, okay? If you um, have the potential to come in with somebody and they'll allow you to bring the actual bottles of things and administer the medications, great. If you have to go to surgery, lighter sedation is better than heavier sedation. Awake is even better than, than asleep. So keep stay as light as you can. And some people will use like ultra short acting anesthetic drugs. Um, you know, like there's a, an IV drip called Versed. That's just one of many things. And you have to see like what's, what's right for you in that particular situation. And then seeing, you know, like what, what it is that, that, you know, is going to happen. So if you end up going into the um, hospital, Having them immediately start to think about, could you get a physical, occupational, speech and swallow therapist there, like right away, starting to see you, that can be very preventative. That can actually, you think, oh, they're going to spend a lot of money on this. It's actually not a lot of money compared to what can happen to you if you keep staying in the hospital, okay? So getting you moving with those rehab therapists can be very good, okay? Getting you back on medications on time every time, three out of four people not getting it, very good, okay? And if it looks like, you know, gosh, I'm gonna need some time to like recover and I need to get out of this hospital setting, a very good place for Parkinson folks to convalesce and get better 
is a week or two stay in an inpatient facility that has full-time physical occupational speech, swallow, social workers and people, because they can you know, get around you, they can meet with the family regularly and they can try to help you to get back up on your feet. And, so, and if you're stable enough, sometimes that can be a better place for you. And having said that, when you go to the clinic, if you're doing like super poorly, sometimes the better place for you is to have a short rehab admission, you know, with that rather than to go into the hospital. Okay. And, um, and, and have that team rally around you and do all those things. If there's no infection, if there's no, if it's just some disease progression, which happens with Parkinson, then that's something that's on the menu that, that you should consider. So these are some of the things. And then of course, the other thing is, is I'm a big fan. I'm completely biased. I'm a big fan of the aware and care kit and having that information and making sure that you, you either take the kit with you, but also um, there's a free link where you can download the contents and print them out. So if you can't, you know, get a kit, you know, or it's not in time, you can print them out and it has all that information that you can give to the doctors and nurses. And then you are going to be a great communicator. You're going to say, I'm going to be stuck here for hours and hours. Instead of getting frustrated and, and talking at people, I'm going to talk with them. I'm going to make them my friends and I'm going to slowly pull them in to my world, to my planet, to my language. And I'm going to, and I'm going to slowly pull them in, even if they don't want to be pulled in. I'm going to slowly assimilate them instead of trying to push. If you push hard against medical professionals who are busy, they're going to push back and they're going to pay less attention to you and they're going to go do something else. You need to slowly infiltrate. So those would be some of the, some of the tips. Those are great tips. Very practical again. And you mentioned how the, the cost of getting um, a, a, you know, a therapist while you're in your stay could actually be uh, less than what could happen with an extended hospital stay. So when it comes to fall, delirium, infection, aspiration, if we could do a brief worst case things that could go wrong and just so we know, because it's better that we know, right? I know we, no one wants to talk about these things, but so we know what could go wrong during a hospitalization. Could you talk about that briefly, Dr. Oaken? So, um, so I, I'm sorry, can you just rephrase the question for me, sure, like the sure. like specific are, points? Because I don't want to be too repetitive of what we've talked yeah, about already. Yeah. So what are some of the risks of complications while hospitalized? Gotcha. Okay. So, so, so I want to separate that from the things that we've, we've covered. So when you are in the hospital, okay, um, you are not going to be yourself. Okay. In fact, one out of every three in the upper 20%, 28, 29, 30% of people are going to have worsening in their motor symptoms of their Parkinson during the hospitalization. And that is going to persist at discharge. Okay. So if you start to think about one in three people are going to be doing worse with their Parkinson and you know, that's a possibility. Okay. You've got to prepare for that. Okay. 7 billion with a B dollars will be spent on Parkinson related hospitalizations per year in the United States. Okay. The complications. When you're in the hospital, you can fall. If you fall and fracture a hip, it's a totally different scenario moving forward, okay? With how, how good you can do in terms of outcome and your chances of getting back to where you were, you know, before the admission go way down, okay? So you can fall, okay? That's one of the things we worry about the most. You cannot get your medications. And because you don't get your medications, you could have things like aspiration. So you could start to breathe things in the wrong breathing tube because you get stiff and rigid and you're not moving. Because you're not moving and you're in the bed, your constipation can get really bad. And it, it can get to not just uncomfortable, it can become a dangerous phenomenon, you know, constipation if you become impacted that then requires some manual disimpaction and occasionally even a gastrointestinal doc or somebody to help to get you going again. And so 
So keeping your bowels moving while you're there. And then one thing we haven't talked about that can happen to you that happens quite commonly and unfortunately is that there are a number of common medications that block the chemical dopamine. And we know the chemical dopamine is super important to Parkinson and to making sure that you are, are doing well. And so if they give you a medicine like metoclopramide or Reglan is another name for it, to speed your stomach up because after surgery and after hospitalizations, your stomach might turn off, okay? And then they wanna turn it on. So they give you the one medication that's got an FDA approval to do that. Guess what? It blocks dopamine, it can make you worse in the short and long term. You have a headache when you're in the hospital or you complain about something in the middle of the night. You don't speak their language. They're gonna call some random doctor in the middle of the night who's gonna be half groggy, probably won't remember it the next day, not to scare anybody. But, um, and they're gonna, they're gonna give you like things that are kind of on their safe list. And their safe list includes things like metoclopramide, Reglan. It includes things like Compazine for headaches, Phenergan for headaches and for nausea, okay? Those things block dopamine and gonna make your Parkinson worse. And if they give you dopamine blockers, it can extend your stay to as long as two weeks or longer, okay, in the hospital, okay? Which is not what anybody wants. Blocking dopamine can have long lasting effects that can really extend the hospitalization, then put you at risk for falling during that hospitalization for recovery. So iatrogenic, meaning caused by the physician, okay, the prescribing physician, can lead to you having worsened outcomes, okay? And that's why you have to be vigilant. And then the last point is, is there are two or three medicines that are safe if you have hallucinations, psychosis, paranoia, seeing things that aren't there, or illusions, seeing things. There are two or three things you can take in Parkinson that won't in general worsen your Parkinson motor symptoms. These are drugs like clozapine, which requires some blood monitoring or quetiapine or Seroquel or Pimavanserin, okay? These drugs, Nuplazid is what Pimavanserin is sold under. These drugs, they don't worsen the Parkinson symptoms can be given for hallucinations, but commonly in the hospital, in the middle of the night and during the day, if people don't speak Parkinson as a language, they're gonna give you Haldol. And that is one of the ones that can really extend your hospitalization and several of the other medications and lead to, to, you know, to becoming stiff and rigid. Maybe you breathe things in the wrong tube. Maybe you get a pneumonia, maybe you fall out of bed because you're confused and break something. And so the atrogenic stuff is the reason why Andrea, it's so important for the caregiver and the care partner to play that role of advocacy, to make friends with people, to watch what's going on, to be there if they can. And then when they bring the out all in the middle of the night, you say, what is that? Whoa, 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 what is that? Say, no, no, we, we, we'll hold off on that. We'll, why don't you, I'd rather have you strap him down or her down, you know, while we figure this out. We're gonna hold off on that. You know, like we're, you know, like no, no, there's no, like, we don't, we don't want to fight with you or anything, but we're going to refuse that because look at here in the aware and care kit. Look, at, it's here. It's, it's written here. Can we do one of these other things instead? And so I think having that relationship, that's not like a push, you know, like you're, you're pushing off each other, you're talking at each other, super important, but complications can happen. And one other thing, Andrea, just to mention is one of the worst things that can happen is called sepsis. And sepsis is when you have an infection, okay? And it can start multiple places. It could start in your skin, it could start in your mouth, but the most common place for it to start is in your urinary tract, whether you're a man or a woman. You get a urinary tract infection, and if it gets into your bloodstream, it becomes systemic, right? And then it, your blood's pumping all over your body. You get a high fever, and this can be life-threatening, okay? So this is another reason when you get, you know, you're getting symptoms and, you're, and, and the first symptom of a urinary tract infection or even sepsis can be somebody just acting not right. Go to your doctor, get checked for chest x-ray and a, and, a, and, a, and a urinalysis. If you can avoid the hospitalization and pick it up, you can also avoid sepsis. Sepsis has a high mortality associated with it if it gets into your bloodstream, particularly if you have multiple times that you get sepsis. So again, being as preventative as you can is, is super important, Andrea. Thank you. And you were um, uh, rattling a lot off a lot of those drug names. Those are all in the Aware and Care Kit, correct? That's correct. Yep. And the, the, you know, do not, okay. So 
for those questions, uh, what can he repeat those? Uh, go to the Aware and Care Kit, and then that's going to be the perfect resource to share um, with those nurses and healthcare workers because it will be in writing from the Parkinson Foundation, from uh, uh, you know where they're going to be primed to receive that. You're not going to have to remember how it's spelled or pronounced. So Aware and Care Kit, thank you for putting yeah. it in the chat. Um, and another question related to your comment way to you wrapped it all up in there uh so we thank you for that great answer no um so hospitalists that doctor in the middle of the night who doesn't know you from adam and who just knows your chart any idea since you speak the language and know the mentality how to deal with them is it forming that relationship? You know, is it going through the nurses? What advice would you have around hospitalists? Yeah, so um, first of all, just to add, Annie Brooks is the person that can help you with hospitalization kits at the Parkinson Foundation. She's a real champion for this, if you remember that name. And then also there's the 1-800-4-PD-INFO, uh, you know, for we're all old enough here on this call um to know that it's 1-800 and then there are numbers on the on your telephone for you know pd for parkinson info and um and they can also help to hook you up with this um so you know in terms of of, of thinking you know uh, about you know like the trying to be you know as as reflective as we can you know and is trying to be as you know, proactive as we can. I think the best advice that I can give you, Andrea, is to is to you know kind of be ready, um, be a great communicator, um, make sure that you make an attempt. Okay, and don't don't have an expectation that your attempt is going to yield anything positive but it's kind of like you throw out as many lifelines as you can right it's like throw out as many light and hopefully something's going to bite so you go in the hospital you immediately make a call and leave a message or if you have one of these great my chart systems on epic you know or on one of these things if you're on the online medical record and you're able to speak to your doctor in their doctor's office that way send a message saying you know sally is in the hospital here's the situation be great if you could get in contact with the doctor and coordinate care. You know, if you can't, do you have some advice? You know, like just try to engage them a, a little bit and let them know what's going on and keep them, you know, going with the play by play. Even if they don't answer you, you know, no matter what happens, keep play by playing it so that they've got information, right? So you're feeding information into the system and eventually the line bites, right? If you're really lucky and you live in a high level system, and you have a really good doctor, then then if you get the name, if you ask the name of the attending physician and the name of the of the hospitalist or whoever is taking care of you, if you get the name and information of that person, you know, then you want to start including that in the messages you're sending to the other doctors. See if you can bridge and get them to start talking to each other. If you very nicely um, ask the the attending hospitalist or give them a note, you know, the, the, you know, like the, the charge nurses or the nurses in charge of the whole unit, just ask the charge nurse, Hey, this is my doctor that I have. This is his email or his information, depending on what he's willing, he or she is willing to give. I'd love it if your hospitalist could get in touch with my doctor to make sure you know that they have Parkinson and so they can talk you know particularly if it's a neurologist whoever your trust your most trusted doctor is of course it doesn't work well if you're not confident in your doctor right which is a problem right so if you're not confident in your doctor find another doctor it doesn't have to be a parkinson doctor it can be a really good family doctor or internist or something you need to have some confidence in the doctor and then the person that you have confidence in getting that person to talk with them you know together and then making sure you know, like you make up a, a packet of information for the hospitalist, you know, so even if you don't say it, just to, to say here, you know, like write on a note, making sure you don't give dopamine blockers like how all making sure meds are on time and we'd love to be able to do this. Here's some information from the Parkinson Foundation. We're here to help and just keep trying to be that helping voice and stay patient. But if you scream and you yell, it only makes it worse talking at the 
at them instead of talking with them. That's my best advice. I'm not saying it's right or wrong, everybody. I get mad too. Uh, I have teenagers at home, so I've had my moments. But, um, but, but those would be some of the things I would think about. That is going to be one of those pearls that I think sticks with me and, and sticks with us. Um, yes, it's, should it be that way? No, is it a shame? Yes, but if, let's talk, let's communicate as human beings to that nurse, to that health team, talk with them, not at them, with, not at. Um, and let's see from the chat, um, Cindy shared a couple examples where the EMTs actually were amazing and knew a lot about Parkinson's. And Cindy said that she is her own caretaker. Um, I imagine, you know, lives alone. So just calling out to those folks um, living alone that, yeah, you have, you know, that you have uh, twice as hard of a, a job. Um, so I'm glad that you're here. I'm glad that you're listening. I'm glad that you're uh, going to get your wear and care kit so you can provide, uh, prepare. And let me make sure I'm not uh, missing anything else. I think we have some um, some nurses in the audience. Carol, um, so retired, you know, was in uh, uh, was in healthcare and has that double perspective. So hello, Carol. Um, let's see. Mm, okay, so this is a question that is coming up in a lot of different ways. And as we come to the the top of the hour, so. Um, a lot of folks said that they have, they already in regular life have anxiety about off time, about timing their medications, about off happening at the worst po possible moment. When a hospitalization or a procedure, or someone said, even I have to do, I have dental work and this is, that's not exactly the same, but in a lot of ways, it's also, you know, um, what we're talking about is relevant. So. What advice would you give Dr. Ogin about those folks who are listening to all of this and it's the anxiety levels are, are ratcheting up? Right. So, um, so first of all, I say, turn the temperature down. No reason to, to be anxious. Like, like you gotta be Zen, like with Parkinson, the more Zen you are, the better you're going to do. So, so Parkinson is a Zen disease. You got to get rid of people that are pissing you off. You got to get rid of people that are, you know, just, you know, getting your go, getting you going. Your Parkinson symptoms are going to be worse the more anxious you have, you, you are. Okay. So I don't want anybody sitting around worrying about like these scenarios playing out. What I want you to be is Zen and proactive and educated. Okay. So all you need to do is have an aware and care kit or print it out review the materials, have it ready to go next to the door. And when you're, when and if it happens, you're ready. You know, you've got the, and, and if you forget it, no big deal. Just call the 1-800-Parkinson line, talk to one of our specialists that, that's, that's there. I meet with them once a month for any questions they can't answer. They're awesome, you know, and they have team members that are everything from nurses to therapists, everything, they'll help you. And uh, they can give you another kit that you can get online at the, if you go to the hospital, you can get online, you can print one of the kits out. All you need to, you know, remember is hospitalization kit and Parkinson, you're going to find it on Google. Um, and, uh, and there's no reason to, to, um, to raise the temperature at all. And, um, and the other thing is, um, there's been some research on people that stay married. Okay, so why is he talking about people that stay married? Okay, people that stay married, they tend to not raise their voices when they talk to each other. Okay, they stay very calm. Okay, and so one of the things that's good for Parkinson is a calm state of mind. And when you're in the hospital and everybody on that planet is going nuts, I want you to remember I need to be calm, I need to talk calm, I need to talk slower. At half speed, quarter speed, just just be calm. Everybody that I'm, I, be calm, be kind, be zen. Get your hospitalization kit. You're gonna have plenty of hours. You're gonna have more hours than you know what to do with. Okay, to to figure this out. That's 
a plus side. Like sometimes in an emergency, like there's a big emergency, you know, somebody needs something, you gotta, you gotta solve the problem like right away. Here, you're gonna have some time to, to sort this out. So you take a breath, ask for some help, but, but, but stay calm and stay zen. And, um, and I, I think that you'll do better um, with this. Well, we're, you said, stay informed, stay educated. We're all here on today learning. Um, we're all going to get, uh, if we don't have it already, an wearing care kit and be proactive, uh, read through the materials, digest, update with maybe your own medication list. Um, and um, I think the tips that people have shared uh, in the chat, um, yeah, talk to your support group. This is something that, um, you, you know, a lot of people put in uh, um, uh, stories how the ER doctor said, I'm going to look over here. And if you need to, you know, take your medicine, then, you know, uh, do what you need to do. Um, there's a lot of hope in experiences when people have been hospitalized or had a procedure, a lot of great tips. So I think uh, I like that call to, to Zen and uh, be proactive, be informed, but we got this. There are folks like Dr. Oaken out there uh, working hard on the other side of the equation to make sure that um, hospitals, that uh, medical students, that physicians, that healthcare workers know about Parkinson's. Um, and today going over, you know, uh, um, the education that was shared, learning some of those, uh, those pearls how to speak people's language, um, that length of stay, again, to speak with people, not at them. I think that th that has this has all been very, very helpful and hopefully uh, encouraging to everyone. So um, any final words, Dr. Oaken, as we reach the, uh, the top of the hour and our time together? No, I, I, I think I would just say, you know, Make every day your best day. Um, try not to worry. Be zen. You know, we, the resources are there to help you. It's not always perfect. And um, and just, you know, ask for help when you're going through. And we'll all try to help you as much as we, as much as we can. And we want you to be successful. We know you can have a great life with Parkinson. And so, um, so go do it. Go have a great life. Thank you. Yes, we are here for you. As Roger from Rossville said, uh, stay connected to PMD Alliance. We're here. We're listening. We want to help create resources, share education. Um, we're here with you. You're not alone. Thank you, everyone, for joining, for tuning in. Yes, this was recorded. And Kelly, if you could share the chat session and we can include that with the uh, with the upload. Very good tips, I agree. Um, so as always, we close with a little uh, moment of uh, zen and eye contact, um, a wave of gratitude. Thank you, Dr. Ogin, for your time today. Thank you, everyone, for sharing your questions and your experiences. It's good to see all of you. I just love scrolling through the, the gallery view and, and seeing people from all over the country and the world who, who tuned in together. So thank you all for joining, and we will See you uh, hopefully soon on a Zoom program um, in the very near future. So until then, farewell, everyone. And thanks again, Dr. Ogin. This was wonderful. My pleasure. Have a great day.